Good morning, Trinity. How are you? Um, my name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, a lot of us student ministry were coming back from summer camp. And this represents some of the summer camps I've been to over the years. I, I've just collected them. And summer camp has a very, like, some of these photos, I look good. I'm just saying. Um, I need to lose about 80 pounds, but uh, I look good. Um, so I, I brought these in. So on top in my office, on, I've got on this, on this top shelf, I've got everything that means something to me. Um, trips that I've taken. Um, pictures of students that signify a moment in, in our time of ministry together. And so I brought these this morning because we're going to kind of focus a little bit on summer camp, um, kind of, because I know that a lot of you like summer camp is like this to you, like it does nothing for your heart rate. Right? But so I want to focus a little bit, a lot on this mountaintop experience that students face and the mountaintop experience that we have in our life with what God's doing. And the reason why summer camp is important to me is in the summer of 1993, I accepted Christ at summer camp. That was the moment in my life when I realized the need for a Savior. And it's very easy to remember the date I was baptized. And as some of you are thinking, well, you know, I don't remember the date. Well, I can remember the date very easily because it was July 4th, 1993. It's pretty easy, you know, because I remember getting baptized and going out into the church parking lot and shooting off fireworks. And I don't know what that moment is for you in your life, but there's this tug on your heart that maybe God is speaking to you in some way, shape, or form. And this morning, I want you to pause just a little bit and think, what's God talking to me about? Summer camp is very important. And as I introduce a couple of students this morning that are going to help me preach and teach, I want to invite Caden up here. Caden spoke to God and he had this moment where God spoke to him, and he got something out of camp. And he had that mountaintop experience that I want him to share with you guys. Oh. Okay, so when I went to camp, it was like, so God talked about, like, so when one shepherd, like when one sheep gets lost, the shepherd will go find it, and he'll leave the other 99 and go find it. That's what I want to talk about. Thanks. Good. So Caden came to this realization that God is after that one person, no matter where they're at in life, that that one person matters. And, and for me, in the summer of 1993, I was that one person. Maybe you're sitting in this room this morning and you're that one person that God is pursuing. What does that mountaintop experience look like for you? Here's why camp is so impactful. It's because we remove students from their daily environment. Where we were at, there wasn't a lot of cell phone coverage. So they couldn't call mom, they couldn't call dad a lot, they couldn't get on social media, it just, it was slow. And so we remove all of the distractions from their life. So for you, in your daily life, what is it that are those distractions, those moments that God seems to speak to you? So we're going to look at the story of Elijah this morning. If you've got your Bibles, go to 1 King um, chapter 18 is kind of where we're going to be. And we're going to look at the story of Elijah. And the story of Elijah, I love because there's so much to it. So Elijah is this prophet, and he is bold and he is confident in one moment. And the next moment, he is running for his life. And I think for us... We are really bold and confident one moment in God. We trust him 100%, but the next moment we're afraid and we run. And that's exactly what we see in Elijah. So let me set the scene a little bit. So Elijah uh, is frustrated with all these false gods, and he's getting ready to put them to the test. He says, hey, I know that you represent this God of Baal, and, so, and I represent God. My God, the one true God. So we are going to have an ultimate throwdown. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to sacrifice something. And he gives these specific instructions. And so they get together and he's like, you do your thing and I'll do my thing. And we'll see which God answers. So the, the, the Baal, all the prophets get together and they get ready to sacrifice this thing. And it just doesn't work because there's no God. And it's, it's awesome. Because what happens in this moment, Elijah begins to taunt them. He says, maybe your God is sleeping. Think about this. God doesn't need sleep. Like he's not like taking a nap, taking a little siesta, right? 
He's God. Maybe your God is on a journey. Well, think about this. God doesn't need to take a journey. He's, he, if he's God, it, so Elijah taunts their God. He makes fun of them, and it doesn't work. So finally he goes, step off. And then he pours water on his sacrifice, and he keeps doing it, doing it, doing it. And he goes, okay, here's where it happens. God, show these people who you are. And God shows up, and he shows off. And then I love this. After all this happens, in 1 King 1840, it says, Then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized him, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slew them there. What it basically says is he was bold enough in this idea of who his God was and these false prophets, he called them all down, and he said, kill them all. Get rid of them. I don't know about you, but that's pretty bold. Elijah has this bold, confident moment in God. One of our students at camp, Haddon Davis, has this bold, confident task that he, I, he shared with me. And I want him to take a moment what God is speaking to him about in this idea of being bold in student ministry and just in life. So I had noticed for the past several months that Mark is trying to draw our student ministry out of our comfort zone. And I began at this camp, I realized why. It's because, it's because of an event that occurred that Tuesday. Um, so that Tuesday, I was out shooting the guy at basketball. Uh, he came from El Paso. And uh, after talking a little bit, I found out he's struggling between a Gnostic and atheist. And I realized, as, as an after that, I continued to pursue him throughout the week with questions. And, uh, okay, you know, the counter, why does he don't believe this? So he don't believe this, because why is that? And I realized I'm not sure a lot of our students would have done that. And so, and so I'm, so I'm working with Mark, Mark. I'd like to work with Mark over the course of the next few years to help, help draw our student ministry out of our comfort zone. But, even, but just take, taking the small steps first, you know, send by someone new, get to know them. And then from there, we build and do what I do. That's good. So this concept of Elijah being bold and confident, Haddon is taking like, hey, let's be bold and confident in our student ministry, and let's start breaking down some of these barriers. And Haddon is leading the way. He's got three or four students that are going to start meeting new students, start branching out a little bit. So in this moment, Elijah's confident. He's bold. Well, this is where it takes a turn for the worse. This queen by the name of Jezebel, there's a reason why you don't name your daughters Jezebel, right? And so this is a very wicked, wicked queen. And she finds out what happens. And what happens is Jezebel says, I am going to find you and punish you for what you did to my prophets. And Elijah, you would think at this moment he's on top of the world and is confident in God. He's just like, come at me. That's not what he does. What he ends up doing is he begins to walk by sight and not by faith. All he knows is there's this lady that's after him, and now he's a terrified for his life. So he runs, and he runs into this cave. And I believe this cave is significant in our life. Yeah, I think it's a beautiful picture for us. Because in this moment, as Elijah's in the cave, and he's running for his life, I believe this is his moment of rest. This is where he's able to gather his thoughts. This is where he's just able to think, what's next? So we catch up the story, and he's in this cave. He just rests. I, don't, I think at this moment, Elijah begins to get back on track with where God wants him to be and who Elijah is. And so we pick up the story in 1 Kings 19, 9 through 11. It says, And he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenants, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. 
So he said, Go forth, stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and strong wind was rendering the mountains and breaking it in pieces and the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. We'll stop there. So here's what happens. God calls Elijah up on this mountain. He says, what are you doing hiding in this cave? What are you doing running? Don't you believe in who I am? Don't you trust me more than anything? And then Elijah goes on to this speech and he goes, I've been passionate for you, God. My heart breaks for what's going on. And God says, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go on top of this mountain. In those mountaintop experiences, we all have them. It's when we feel we're on top of the world. We feel that we are closest to God. Sometimes those moments we just stumble upon. I think in some way, shape, or form, Elijah just stumbled upon this moment. He didn't know he was going. I don't think he thought, I'm going to go in this cave. I'm going to rest, and I'm going to gather my thoughts. I think he was just running, and here's a spot to play hide-and-go-seek. I'm going to hide and hope no one seeks me. I think he just stumbles upon it. For you, what is that moment where you just stumbled upon finding Christ, or he found you? Sometimes it's in the matter of aligning yourself with where you need to be. So after camp, students feel they're closest to God. And I think a lot of it is because they're removed from technology. So I want to introduce Maddie Harless. Maddie is one of our students, and she had one of those experiences that I want her to share with you guys. Um, so before camp, I prayed and asked God um, to reveal himself to me through prayer and through scripture. And um, I just wanted to hear his voice. And while I was there, his scripture became real to me. And so in camp, we had to have specific quiet times each day. And it helped me focus on what God wanted me to see. And um, I think one thing in particular that I was leaning towards when I was in these quiet times was that God cares about relationships with friends and family. Um, he, he cares and um, um, I'm trying to remember. You're okay. <laughs> um, so he spoke to you about relationships. Why does he care about those relationships? Um, I just, I realized that, <laughs> man, okay, I can't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> You're okay. Um, so when he spoke to you about these concepts of relationships, how does that affect you? It showed me that, um, I need to be kind and forgiving to other people even when I don't think that they may deserve it. And um, in his scripture, he um, pointed to specific verses that, um, that showed me how to deal with some of the relationships I'm going through. And, um, and I think that's really cool. And, Looking back afterwards, I can see the prayer that I had, um, that I prayed for his voice, and I can see his voice now and how he was revealing himself to me. Um, also, another thing, I was, we talked about our next spiritual step, and um, I felt like God was um, telling me that I need to be more bold and have more spiritual conversations with people like this, um, <laughs> like sharing my faith. And the cool thing was um, the last message at Lone Tree was all about being the salt of the earth and um, being uh, just light for God and um, showing your faith to other people. And um, it's just cool how 
big God is and that he cares about all the little details to grow your faith. And I think that's really cool. So. That's good. Thank you, Maddie. So in this moment, Elijah goes up on top of this mountain, and, and we continue the story, and he says, And behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and strong wind was rending, rending the mountains and breaking in pieces and rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And the, in the wind then came an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire was a sound of a gentle blowing. It's interesting that God comes in these three things. It doesn't come in these three things. The earthquake, the fire, and this wind. What, how I take this in my life, we create a lot of earthquakes, fire, and wind. In terminology today, some of us like to live in the drama. Some of us like to create drama. God doesn't come in those things a lot of the times. He doesn't come in the drama, the earthquake, and the winds. He does, but not all the time. In Elijah's moment, he, he's called up on this mountain, and he says, hey, God's going to come. I need you to be ready for it. He comes in this gentle whisper. And I don't know what that whisper is in your life, but the way that I phrase it for students is this. We live in a busy world. We live in a busy life. We become too busy for God. He's the first thing that goes in our life when our schedules get busy. Because we like to live in that earthquake and fire and wind. And sometimes he just wants to come in the still, in the quiet. So we're working through spiritual habits. And in these spiritual habits, we all have them. We all have good habits, but we also we have bad habits too, don't we? So what we're working on in the student ministry is some spiritual habits. And it's an acrostic. The H is for hang time with God. We want our students to have a daily quiet time. A is for an accountability. We want our students to be accountable to another believer. Same spiritual walk, same gender. B is for Bible memorization, and one of them's up there. We want our students to memorize scripture. I stands for involvement in the church. We're not supposed to be separate in the student ministry building or isolated, but we are a part of the local body. We are part of this congregation, <laughs> whether you like it or not, right? <laughs> T is for tithing commitment. We want our students to tithe. We want them to understand what tithing looks like. And S is for studying scripture. We want them to have these daily disciplines, these spiritual habits. And so as we come back to camp, from camp, we're implementing these. And there's brochures and pamphlets. If a student comes up to us and says, hey, I want to start a quiet time, we will give them a pamphlet. They'll turn in a card. We will track that. We will make sure they're doing it. And one of our students that came back from camp is Matthew Newton. And his story started last year, and it continued this year, and he just had this idea of spiritual disciplines on his own, and I want him to share with you. All right, guys, I'm Matthew. Um, so last year at camp, it was really impactful for me. I started to grow in Christ and grow relationships with other people, and that was really cool. It was kind of like God speaking to me through my friends and through the counselors and um, through people like Mitchell and just everyone in general. Um, I, I really took that home with me, and I grew over the past year um, in different ways. I started a quiet time. I started Bible studies and just really kind of got um, connected with Christ, and that was really cool. Um, I was really happy that I did that, and this year I, at camp, I kind of took that and ran with it and formed more relationships, and I tried to be more of a leader, um, tried to get out of my comfort zone with talking to people that I usually wouldn't talk to and just kind of... Um, getting more involved in the games and things I didn't do in the past, and I feel like God really wanted me to um, to do that for that reason, just of growing relationships and especially with Him and helping other people um, have maybe a similar experience as I did that I could push them to have you know that same relationship with Him. So, all right, that's it. That's good. Thank you, Matthew. So in Joshua 1.8, it says, Keep this book of the law on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. Do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Like, that is my prayer for students, that they meditate on God's word day and night. That they create some spiritual habits. When Elijah goes up into this mountain, he is afraid and running for his life. 
I don't know at this moment he knew what was going to happen. I don't think he was ready for it. I don't think he was expecting God to be in the quiet. Maybe if when God doesn't show up right away, Elijah's getting worried. When God doesn't show up in our life right away, don't we get a little worried? Like we expect him to show up immediately. And maybe there's some, some lesson in the process where Elijah's waiting for God and he doesn't come in the first three things. He comes in this whisper. So in 1 Kings 19, 12 and 18, this is what it says. After, it says in 13, when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him. And he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Then he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left. And they seek my life to take it away. I'm sure there's some practical application with the idea that Elijah repeats exactly what he said the first time. He's afraid. He's honest. Then the Lord, in verse 15, then the Lord said to him, Go, return your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you have arrived, you shall anoint Azel, king over Abraham, Abram, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi. You shall anoint king over Israel, and Elisha, and the son of Saphat, and Abel Mahola. And you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Here's, here's what I got. Elijah is told by God to go back. Don't stay on this mountain. Whatever mess it is that you're running from, whatever it is that you're running for your life from, I need you to go back into the fight. I don't need you to stay up here. I need you to go back. I need you to be bold and I need you to be confident where I've called you to be bold and confident. I mean, if we could just take students up to the mountain and keep them on that mountain, keep them away from technology, keep them around all of their Christian friends, man, what fire would we have? But honestly, what good would it be to keep them on a mountain, isolated from the one lost person that matters to God? Can you imagine if we just kept them up there? Who would have missed hearing the gospel? Who would miss the passion behind Caden and, and understanding that, man, one lost person matters? And, and the idea of Haddon wanting to revolutionize accepting others into the youth group, helping others to be transformed. And for you, what about you on Monday morning when you go back to work? You are called to be bold and confident exactly where you are. That's what he calls us to do. That's why he calls us to go back into a place that maybe is not the most Christian environment because we're called to be salt, like Maddie says. We're called to do something. Elijah's not called to stay on this mountain. So God speaks in this quiet moment. I have a son, and his name is Shane. And, I, you know, being a dad changes the way you see things. And it changes the way I see God, most importantly. I don't want to yell at my son, but sometimes it's the only way to get his attention from hanging out with the high school kids. But yet, I have to get his attention. I think God is the same way. I don't think he wants to yell at us to get our attention. I don't think he wants to come in the fire or the earthquake. He just wants us to be in his presence. And when we hear that gentle whisper, we're ready to respond. Because he doesn't have to fight through all of the crud and all the noise in our life. I want to introduce you to one last student, Brooke. And Brooke has a story that she wants to share. It's about what God is doing in her life. Hey, y'all. So like you said, I'm Brooke Anderson. And I'm very clumsy, and these heels are very tall. So if I fall over, then it's okay. I'll be okay. But basically, last week when we were at camp, I walked in with like a conceited mindset. I was like, okay, me and God are good. Like, basically, I'm just going to go and we're going to like get to know each other better, but he's not going to really do anything big in my life because I don't really need it right now. Um, but camp that week was very quiet. And, but then I started noticing every day God would do something and he'd show me something that applied to my life. And I was like, God like knocked sense to me, like knocked sense into me last week. Like, 
first thing he told me was that I loved conditionally. And I was placed in several situations the first and second day where I that I was totally not expecting to be in. I was like, God, you are like messing with my week. I don't really appreciate this. If you could like fix it and do it the way I want it, that'd be cool. But God was like, nah, Brooke, you're, you're good, you're fine. Um, so he told me that, and I always prided myself. I was like, God, I like love people unconditionally. Like that's something I do, that's something that I pride myself in because I'm that good of a Christian. But then he was like, oh, guess what? You kind of aren't that great at loving. And I was like, Oh, okay, well, let's work on that maybe. So God ta taught me that. And then he taught me that, so like I said, the camp was really quiet and I wasn't really expecting to learn anything, but then I, he would teach me things in the small moments. So whenever I was talking to people, he, I was talking to this one person in particular and throughout the week, I decided that it was my mission to save this person. And I was like, okay, I'm just gonna like love him and then he's gonna love Jesus and it's gonna be perfect. Um, but that's not how that worked. So I was talking to this other person and she was like, she's talking, so I was talking to this person and she was talking to somebody else and she was telling this person that your mission is not to save people, it's to love people. And I was like, oh snap, that's Jesus talking to me right there. So God taught me that I needed to love people and that my job wasn't to save people. So those are two things God taught me. So thank you. So Elijah's on this roller coaster, so we can be too. One moment we're here with God, and then the next moment we're in this valley. For you, what is that distraction? Maybe it's your phone, maybe it's social media, maybe it's your job, maybe it's your family, maybe it's sports. Whatever it is that takes you away and distracts you is, can be noise. Those seemingly things can be good, but too much of them can become noise. Elijah is able to hear God when it's quiet. This is why I do youth ministry. Like these five students that you heard from this morning. I, my, I want to point them towards Jesus. I, I want them to go back into their schools, into their communities, into their jobs, and make a difference. Like camp is one week. But yet I want to see that life change over all weeks of the year. For me, camp is important because that's where I accepted Christ. So here's my question for you. Are you too busy to hear God's voice? Are you just too busy to hear his voice? Maybe you are living in the earthquake, you're living in the fire, you're living in this wind, and you're just missing on the gentle whisper that God is saying, come back over here. This is where I'm at. Maybe you're on the mountain right now. And God's telling you, go back to where I need you to be. Last week, or the several weeks, we've heard from Eric, and he's preached on Jonah. It's ironic that Jonah goes back to do what God has asked him to do. He gets his attention, and he goes, hey, I need you to go back to where originally I told you to go in the first place. And maybe that's you this morning. Maybe God's saying, hey, I need you to make a difference right where you're at and not stay on this mountain Elijah stops after this moment, and he realigns himself. Maybe you are, this morning are expecting God to show up in the large and the flashy. Sometimes God doesn't want to show up in the large and flashy. Sometimes he just wants to speak right where you're at. My question for you this morning is, what is too loud in your life that is draining out the voice of God?